Hey, I just finished watching the new Get Back documentary about the Beatles recording sessions from January 1969 that resulted in their Let It Be album and their final live performance as a band. So while it's still fresh in my mind, I wanted to collect my observations about the creative process that I saw in the documentary and relay them back here in a way that hopefully we can all learn something that we can apply in our own creative processes. If you're not familiar with me, my name is Mike Barden and I'm a musician, a keyboard player, and an ambient music composer under the artist's name I-I. I also have a special interest in wanting to understand the inner game of creativity, which crosses over into the areas of the mind, the human experience, and even the nature of consciousness itself. And I also really enjoy sharing what I've learned in these areas so that any person like you or me can learn something and be informed and inspired in our own creative lives. My favorite comments on my creativity videos are the ones where you let me know that you were in some way helped or inspired in your own creative life. So thank you for that. And along those lines, I am currently finishing an online course on how to reconnect with your creative self uh, which will go live in the early part of next year. If you're interested in learning more about that and also helping me finalize the content by letting me know what questions I need to answer in that course, um, you can sign up for more info at the link in the description. And I'll have more information on that at the end of the video. So the reason I say all this up front is that my observations and comments about the Get Back documentary will be specifically focused on the creative process that can be observed there. Now to be clear, I am a lifelong Beatles fan. They're one of my very earliest influences as a musician. And as a young person learning piano, uh, way back in the 1970s, I actually had some sheet music books of their songs. And in many cases, I learned how to play the songs from the sheet music long before I ever actually heard the recordings. And so getting into the music in that particular way was a huge part of how I started to learn about harmony and melody and rhythm and composition. And like many other Beatles fans, I'm well aware of the history and the lore and the personalities involved in a lot of the urban legends and even some conspiracy theories that exist about the band. But none of that is the purpose of this video. Again, I'm specifically interested in what can be learned by observing their creative process in this particular situation. So that said, here we go. The first thing that was obvious as I watched the documentary was all of the obstacles and pressures that they faced throughout the project. First of all, they had an incredibly tight deadline they needed to meet. The deadline got pushed out a couple times, but they still completed the whole project, including the album and performing a live show within one month. Secondly, they were up against some pretty disruptive technical problems, including bad acoustics in their first rehearsal space and uh, malfunctioning recording equipment as they moved into their next one. Third, they had some interpersonal conflicts brewing separately from the technical challenges, but I'm sure the personal tensions and conflicts probably came to a head when they were put under the extra pressure of those technical and deadline challenges. If you've been involved with any sort of creative project, such as a band rehearsal or a recording session, chances are that all these things feel very familiar. In fact, one thing that struck me about the documentary was how incredibly normal everything seemed compared to my own experiences with rehearsals and recording sessions. Technical problems never fail to come around and personal tensions and conflicts are also pretty common and if left to fester could potentially derail a project or even tear apart personal relationships within the group. But on the positive side, if the problems are acknowledged with awareness, flexibility, and grace, they can be worked through many times and overcome. And from what I could see in this project, the Beatles and their creative team were able to see and acknowledge the technical, personal, and deadline challenges, work through them with awareness and flexibility, work within the things they couldn't change, and still come out with a completed project. One example of this awareness and flexibility and openness was from the random visit that they got from an old friend and keyboardist, uh, Billy Preston, right as they were feeling stuck in a creative rut. 
they had already expressed a desire to have a dedicated keyboard player. So when the opportunity presented itself, they were able to recognize it and invite him to play. And that very obviously breathed a new life into the project. And Billy's playing did in fact become a key component in the sound and the energy of this recording. Don't let me down. Don't let me down. It's great. Oh, you us a lift, Bill. But this was just one of the ways that the creative resilience of the band could be seen. When they had problems with one rehearsal space, they moved to another. When they had technical problems, they worked through it. When their initial plan for the live show fell through, they kept considering options until they figured it out. Even as songs were being written, they would work them over and over until something stuck. And even when one of the band members quit, they regrouped and resolved and moved forward. But more on that in the next section. So I think that the first lesson that I saw here is this. Move the obstacles that you can, but work within the ones that you can't. When limitations happen, first acknowledge them and then work through them to change them if possible. And if you can't change them, work within them. The limitations themselves can actually end up being a very positive influence even if they are seen as negatives at first. Limitations can provide a fresh context for the work and a narrower focus of creative energy which can actually be very helpful to the process. And I suppose this leads very naturally to the next significant thing that I noticed, which was the issue of interpersonal tensions and conflict. Very early on in these rehearsals, it became clear that George Harrison was not happy about how things were going, particularly in terms of Paul McCartney attempting to take more of a leadership role after the death of their manager, Brian Epstein, who had always handled these things before. The tension between George and Paul escalated to the point that George decided to quit the band very early on in the project. Part of George's frustration was his noticing how egos were becoming problematic. If you've been in a band or some other creative group before, chances are that you have seen something like this. It can happen anytime different people with different personalities and different ideas about how things should be done start to disagree or clash. Personal conflicts can definitely stop the flow of creativity in a group. And if it's left unattended, it can hurt relationships. It can compromise a project or even bring the group to an end. But as it turns out, George's quitting the band in this moment was not the end of the project or the end of the band yet. And here's why. Because they all saw themselves as a creative team made up of good friends. They gave each other space to process. They suspended their egos for the sake of the whole. And as a result, the band and the project moved forward and was completed. And yes, I'm well aware that those differences continued to grow after this and the band did eventually break up, which is perfectly understandable in light of how young they were when they started and how each person had grown in their own way. This was inevitable and to use George's words, all things must pass. But in the case of this particular project, they were able to successfully work through this and complete it. For me, one of the most striking parts of the documentary was when John and Paul had a private conversation over lunch, which was captured with an audio recorder hidden in a flower pot. You can hear the whole conversation in the documentary and the content of their conversation was significant. I'm not gonna post it here, but if you can see it for yourself near the beginning of part two, you should really check that out. I will attempt to give you my synopsis here, but in doing so, I do run the risk of misrepresenting it, so you should really listen for yourself and see what you think. But from what I could get out of it, I didn't hear Paul or John ganging up against George or throwing around blame, quite the opposite. John pointed out that this was a festering wound in George that they had allowed to happen and they didn't provide any bandages for that wound. John said straight out, we have egos. And Paul also admitted that George was right to be put off. John confronted Paul a bit and told him that he had even been afraid recently to bring up ideas to Paul for fear that he would shut them down. John brought up his frustration with Paul but stopped short of blaming him for the problem. And Paul admitted his own role in creating the tension between them. So there was a real acknowledgement of the role of ego in this whole situation. And they decided together that they would prefer to work through this as a group 
and reconcile with George rather than let this tear apart their relationship and their group dynamic. Now, to be clear, this was a messy situation and the conversation was not an easy one, but the bottom line is that they ultimately agreed that they should try to go to him again and work it out. Because despite this current conflict, underneath it all, they were still friends and they still cared for and respected each other. So what does this have to do with creativity, you might ask? Well, because very often, creativity happens in groups, in relationship with other people. And the quality of these relationships can either empower the creative process or take it down. Yes, egos were involved here, but there was also a real recognition of this fact. And really, just this simple awareness of one's own ego is actually really important. If egos are left unchecked, insisting on digging in and having their own way in all things, creativity suffers and is soon replaced by reactivity, alienation, and broken relationships. When ego takes over a creative project, you may still end up with a final product, but the special energy that comes from a vibrant creative community has been lost. So the second lesson I took away from this documentary is that when personal conflicts arise, it's best to acknowledge and suspend your ego for the sake of the creative outcome. So notice and acknowledge that there is a conflict, acknowledge your own role in this situation, and then if possible, work toward a resolution with empathy and respect for each other. The third thing that was really obvious in the documentary in terms of the songwriting, but really the creative flow of the whole band is playfulness and spontaneity. This is actually an incredibly powerful path to creativity or the generation of new ideas. Part of what made the Beatles great was the way that their music evolved from one style into the next over time to the point that the music of the end of their career barely resembles the music that made them famous in the beginning. One big reason for this was their very obvious level of playfulness. There was an incredible amount of goofing around on these sessions, especially from John, who just fired off one silly or sarcastic comment after the other. But really, everyone was doing this. Playfulness was just a part of how they lived and worked together. There is real power in this kind of approach to a creative project. Not only does it just keep things lighter and more fun, but it helps facilitate what is called a beginner's mind, where everything is constantly unexpected and surprising and new and spontaneous ideas are generated without being too quickly judged as good or bad. The power is that this creates unexpected juxtapositions that can take you into something truly new. It has a similar function to the cut-up method that I discussed in my video about David Bowie. I have the link to that video in my description if you want to check that one out as well. You see this approach of playfulness in many different ways in the documentary, like when Paul is making up a stream of random lyrics and melodies that would eventually become a song. Or like George when he's struggling to find the lyrics he would use in his iconic song, Something. What could it be, Paul? Something in the way she hmm? moves. What attracted me at all? Just say whatever comes into your head each time. Attracts me like a cauliflower until you get the word. Yeah. yeah, but I've been through this one like for about six months. Attracts me like a pomegranate. You can also see this when John and Paul randomly break into old songs from their past or even just make fun of their current songs, putting them in a completely different tempo or a style, as if they're doing a parody. So from the outside, this kind of reckless abandon and goofing around and experimentation can make it seem like they cannot possibly be serious musicians or songwriters, but it is, in fact, an incredibly powerful approach that helped them become one of the most significant songwriters in music history. So the third lesson I took away from watching the Get Back documentary is that playfulness is powerful. So to break out of old patterns and creative ruts, don't take your work so seriously. Play around with it. 
have fun, even poke fun at it. And as new ideas happen, let them flow and don't be too quick to judge if they are good or bad. Why is this so powerful? Because it facilitates a beginner's mind. And a beginner's mind is a highly creative mind. So to recap, here are the top three creative lessons I took away from the Beatles Get Back documentary. One, move the obstacles that you can, but work within the ones that you can't. Number two, acknowledge and suspend your ego for the sake of the creative outcome. By the way, this can apply even if you are working alone, uh, because sometimes your real conflict is with yourself, isn't it? And finally, three, playfulness is powerful. Again, this is because a beginner's mind is the most relaxed and open to new possibilities. A preconditioned mind tends to be more reactionary, more ego-driven, more repetitive, and much less creative. And if I had to reduce these three lessons down to their most basic elements, I would say that each one of them involves awareness and response. Having awareness and then responding with that awareness is at the very heart of creativity. And the thing that will always try to hijack creativity is the repetition of old patterns that happen in the preconditioned and the self-absorbed mind. So, for the Beatles, the Let It Be sessions and the final rooftop performance were certainly fraught with limitations and interpersonal tensions. This was not necessarily their finest moment. And truly, they were reaching their end of being the Beatles. But being the creative force that they were, and in the context of the friendship that they had formed for many years leading up to this moment, they were able to work through these things with flexibility and humor. And despite all the problems, they did finish the album and had their final live performance. If you like what I'm doing in these videos, please like the video and subscribe to the channel so that you will be notified when new ones are posted. And if you would like more information and updates about my upcoming online course on how to reconnect with your creative self, which will be a deeper dive into things like beginner's mind, what creative ruts are and how to manage them, how to increase your level of conscious awareness, learning about metacognition and the differences between your observer self and your observed self, how to manage your ego and connect more consistently with your creative force. If all that's interesting to you, take a moment and click the link in the description. You'll be added to the email list and you can help me complete the course by letting me know the questions that you specifically would want answered. So thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.